Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. We have been discussing about YOLO object detection models. As part of that, we have reached YOLO v4. Previously, we have completed two, two videos about YOLO v4, covering the overview of the model, the architectural details, and some concepts in bag of freebies and bag of specials. In this video, we will cover some more concepts in bag of freebies and bag of specials. There has been delay in the videos due to personal reasons. Sorry for that. From now onwards, I will try to publish regularly. So in our previous video, we have seen the architectural details of YOLO v4. So we covered the concepts of backbone, neck, and then the detector part. Detector part is similar to what is used in YOLO v3. So we are not covering the detector part. So we have already covered that in the YOLO v3. So in previous video, we covered the backbone part, neck part, and some spatial attention module. So this also you can consider it as part of the neck. Now if you look at this, these concepts are part of bag of specials. Spatial pyramid pooling, SAM, path aggregation network. So we, we covered these concepts at part of the previous video. And the MISH activation I have not covered in the YOLO series, but I have a separate playlist of activation functions where I have discussed all the activation functions available. There I have covered MISH activation. You can watch that video in my playlist. So these are the concepts which are covered so far. Now in this video, we will cover these concepts. So specifically, we will cover this residual connections, drop lock, IOU losses, and then cross mini batch normalization. After covering this, we have only these concepts left. The remaining concepts would be mostly about the data argumentation and the training part. Whereas these concepts are some related to architecture and some related to loss functions. So we will cover these concepts in this video. Let us start with cross mini batch normalization. So what is cross mini batch normalization? We all know what is batch normalization, right? Batch normalization is used to reduce the internal covariate shift. So that means every time you train the model, one iteration is completed, the activation functions distribution gets changes. So the weights of the network have to adjust accordingly to the distribution. So that becomes difficult because every iteration you are updating the weight and the next iteration again, your activations are changing. So your weights have to update again to the new distribution. To reduce that, we use batch normalization where we take the mean of the entire batch and variance of the entire batch and we normalize the features with respect to the mean and variance. And after that, we learn the parameters gamma and beta, which are scaling and shifting parameters to generate a new set of distribution. So these are learned distribution. Okay. So this is batch normalization. So I have a separate playlist for batch normalization where I dig deeper into what is the need of batch normalization? Why do we use it? And what is the, what are the equations, how to calculate them? And then Python implementation, everything. So you can watch that series to understand batch normalization in detail. For now, let us assume that you have the basic understand of batch normalization. So batch normalization has certain drawbacks. So it fails in case of small batch sizes because the calculations you are doing mean and variance that is on the batch size. If the batch size itself is two, four like that, then these statistics is not very significant because the assumption is that the batch size is good enough such that it represents your training data set. That is what the assumption of batch normalization and batch normalization was introduced in ImageNet classification tasks. Usually the models are slightly smaller. You can use batch size of 30s or 64, 128 like that, depending on the availability of the GPU. But if you want to use batch normalization for the object detection models, usually the complex models, because of the GPU limitation, right? We cannot use very high batch size. We can go for batch size two, batch size four, batch size eight, or like that. We cannot go train for 32 or 16, unless you have a very good GPU or cluster of GPUs available. So usually for personal works, right? For small projects in our GPUs, whatever we have in our laptop or workstations, we usually keep the batch size of four or two, or sometimes we train even with one also. In these cases, you don't have enough data to compute the mean and standard deviation. So that is why batch normalization won't work. So if you see the graph of this, the green one is the batch normalization. Batch normalization is very good if the batch size is 32. Yes. And batch size is 16 also, it is okay, good. And batch size 8, it has reduced. For batch size 4, it has come down to here. Okay, if you see the ImageNet accuracy, right? Top one accuracy. 
from 70 to 65 it dropped just based on the batch size and if you go to less batch sizes even it will go even down okay so this is one drawback of batch normalization now how to solve this one for solving this there is a concept of cross mini batch because usually mini batch is the one which we update the weights right because the training when we say batch normalization it is actually mini batch normalization so usually what happens your total images you divide into some mini batches and then you train the model for every mini batch that is what you do so instead of taking one mini batch and then computing the mean and variance can you take across mini batches so what if we take the previous batches also for the mean and variance calculations that is the core idea of this cross mini batch normalization so this is one statement mentioned in the paper using cross mini batch normalization for collecting statistics inside the entire batch instead of collecting the statistics inside a single mini batch instead of statistics from a single batch what if we collect these statistics inside the entire batch so if you assume that your total batch is having four mini batches okay then in that case what exactly happens in case of traditional batch normalization you normalize based on these mini batches only this is first mini batch second mini batch third one and fourth mini batch you normalize at that moment itself so you calculate the batch normalization statistics that means mu and sigma okay mean and variance and you normalize here itself and for this particular batch you normalize the values here itself and for the third batch you calculate the statistics and normalize similarly for the fourth batch also you calculate the statistics and normalize so if you observe here they are accumulating the weights these are actually gradients and updation is happening weight updation is happening only at the end of the batch okay so this concept is called as gradient accumulation if you check the first mini batch you are only accumulating the gradients you are not updating the weight second mini batch also you are accumulating them third mini batch accumulating fourth mini batch accumulating and finally once all the four batches are done then you update the weight okay so this is gradient accumulation instead of updating the weights based on single batch itself you can accumulate across some set of batches and then update the weights at the end so that is a separate concept but here in this plot diagram they are showing that concept so i am explaining that because you might confuse that why this one is happening here but why weight updation is not happening here because that is mini batch right usually when we are training when we load the mini batch at the end of the mini batch itself we update the weight also here also we update the weight here we update the weight here we update the weight every mini batch we update the weight that is what we usually perform but here in this diagram which we mentioned in the paper they have mentioned like this so they are not updating the weights here and they are updating only at the end same way for batch normalization also scaling and shifting operation whatever the parameters are there scale and shift parameters gamma and beta so those parameters also they are updating only at the end of the batch whereas batch normalization is happening at every mini batch here so if you consider this is your original batch normalization now what i am saying in case of cross mini batch you consider all the batches you consider the statistics from all the batches to compute the batch normalization so if you consider this what i am doing here i am calculating the gradients that is fine for batch normalization also i am calculating the values and i am normalizing here because before this this is the first mini batch before this i don't have anything available so i can directly normalize the data here whereas if i come to the second mini batch then if you see i am accumulating the statistics from t minus 3 t minus 2 so this is 3 min t minus 3 and this is t minus 2 so that means whatever the previous statistics are there mean and variance that also i am taking here and then i am calculating the mean and variance across these two batches so if you take this particular box this is the first mini batch it is only using this particular batch so if you take this one this is the first mini batch second mini batch third mini batch and fourth mini batch there is no previous batch available so this is the first time it got a batch so it will automatically normalize here itself whereas for the second time it will take 1 comma 2 both these batches to calculate this statistics for the third batch it will take t minus 3 to t minus 1 so that means this total thing so that is 1 comma 2 comma 3 whatever the previous batches we have seen so far for all of them you calculate the statistics 
And if you take the fourth one, you take from this one to this one. That means from this to this total, everything you take to calculate the statistics, which are mu comma sigma. Okay. And then you normalize the activations. So if you take the fourth mini batch, the statistics are calculated. This mean and variance are calculated using one comma two comma three comma four. All these batches data set. So this is how the cross mini batch normalization works. For updating the fourth batch, you take all the previous batches statistics. For updating the third batch, you take all the previous batches statistics. For updating this, you take all the previous batches like this. But for this, there is no previous batch, so you directly calculate the statistics here itself and then you normalize the activations so this way as you progress through the data set you get more and more data because if i want to update here if i want to normalize the activations here then i am getting this total data available right so that is what it is doing cross mini batch normalization hope you understood the concept next we will see multi input weighted residual connections okay so this is the idea from efficient date paper because when YOLO V4 was developing, they compared the results with efficient date. Efficient date was the state of the art at the time. So this idea they took from that paper. And usually this is in the neck part. In the neck, usually we have FPN, path aggregation network, all of these things, right? So similarly, this is one more concept which we can use in the neck, which is called bi FPN, bidirectional FPN. So this is also equal as bidirectional FPN. If you see, this is the efficient debt architecture. This is the backbone from the input. It goes upwards like this one by one. You can see by two, by three, by four, all these things. And then this is the bidirectional layer. And this is the same bidirectional FPN layer. This is the bidirectional FPN layer. So they are using three times repeatedly. And after that, every output going to detection head. Okay. So this is the efficient debt architecture. Now they are taking YOLO people, they took this particular concept and applied in the YOLO architecture. So let us see that concept, how that works. So we all know how this FPN works. If you don't know how FPN works, you can watch the previous video. There we discussed path aggregation network also. Both of these we discussed in the previous video. So this is actually, if this is my traversed path from the first layer to the last layer in the backbone, from there, if you want to aggregate these features again, you approach this way again, top to bottom. Whereas path aggregation network, they found that, okay, only having one path for aggregating the features is not enough. We have to use two paths. So this is one and this is up again. So path aggregation network is using one top to bottom and bottom to top, two paths. Now efficient dead people, they used bidirectional FPN. In bidirectional FPN, what they did is, they approach, they took the concept of this one where you have two directions, that is fine. But what if you can directly do one shortcut connection this like this also? Okay, so that is what residual connections are. Residual connections are these shortcut connections. And along with that, they added one more concept weighted. That means whatever the inputs coming to this particular node, let's say I'm taking this node, whatever inputs coming to these, if we can assign some weight to them, then that would be better instead of taking these things because some features might be important, some features might not be important. So if we can assign some weights and learn them during the training so that it will get proper information because instead of treating all of them equally, what if we assign some weights? That is the main idea here. So if you check what they have done is they have removed some layers here, some nodes in between from path aggregation network and for the intermediate layers, for every layer, they added the weight. Okay. So structure wise, it is similar to path aggregation network. One addition is adding the shortcut connections. And second addition is adding the weights. For every input, it is a weighted value now. It is not the original value. It will be weighted using the weight values. So those weight values are learned. So that is the concept of multiple input and weighted residual connections. So this is also called as bidirectional FPN. Now this concept, let us see how the weights are updated. So if you take this one TD P6, that is this level, P6 level is this. Now in this level, this is the intermediate value node, which is PTD6. Now for this, 
what we are doing one convolution operation wherever this dot is there that is a convolution operation if it is not there that is a direct connection so now this convolution operation of what are the inputs coming to this one inputs are coming from p6 from p7 both the inputs are coming right now if you see p6 they are adding one weight here and p7 they are adding one more weight here why are we doing resize for p7 if you see this this is by 2 this is by 4 this is by 8 by 16 by 32 like this right the feature maps if i take this is original input resolution usually when we are going like this in the network the resolutions will get reduced like this now for p7 if i want to add to this p6 this is 32 and this is 16 both are at different resolutions so i have to resize that is what upsampling layer will do so this resize is actually called upsampling and for normalizing you just divide by both the weights sum of both the weights this is just for normalization and this term is to avoid divided by zero or zeros values okay so this is how you add the weights similarly if i consider p6 out that means this particular node okay for this node what are the inputs one input is coming directly from the p6 which is the residual connection and one from the intermediate output and one from p5 whatever p5 out is there so this is actually p5 out whatever p5 out is there that also coming as input here so three inputs are coming one input is p6 one input is p6 intermediate value and next one is p5 out so this p5 out again it will be resized okay it will be down sampled because this is higher resolution whereas p6 is having lower resolution so this will be down sampled so if you see there are three weights here again and then divided by some of the weights to normalize so this is how for every connection in this particular node here for every connection here whatever the inputs coming for all of them you add the weights now these w1 w2 w3 these weights are actually learned parameters so the network will learn which connection is important for me i cannot treat all of them equally so that is where it is having weighted residual connections so this concept they have added in yolo v4 okay it is borrowed from efficient rate architecture hope you understood this clearly it is very simple concept one modification from pnit is add the residual connections and for every connection add the weights that's it so it is used in the neck part next concept is drop block regularization hope everyone knows how a dropout layer works dropout randomly removes some of the neurons usually dropouts are used in the dense layers that means fully connected networks so where you have multiple neurons like this connected to multiple neurons like this so this is where you consider the dropout whereas if you apply dropout to the convolution layers which are like this on the image like this then dropout might not work it might not work because if you check this one right this is your input okay so this is my input and this is my feature map right so this green color whatever it is there that is my activation region because the actual object is available here right so based on this actual object this green is actually my area of interest where i have good amount of activations good features so if i directly apply drop out here it is randomly removing these regions right so these into indicates random removal of these particular activations if you check that most of them are available outside my region of interest so if this is my region of interest most of them are available here but if i remove them also if i keep them also it should not matter much for me whereas i should learn to remove these things more compared to these things that is where dropout should work right but if you randomly initialize usually dropout what we do we create a probability score like 0.5 that means out of the available features activations remove 50 percent of the activations during training randomly so if that is how these random connections are decided so if you see all of these output the white color boxes 
whatever into marks are there in the white color those are not my interest because the features are of background here those are not of my object of interest so that is where this might fail so whereas we need to do drop block we need to drop the activation still but we need to drop them as blocks so you see this is one block this is one block like this then in that case we are dropping this particular portion here in the top right right by dropping this portion we are trying to learn how a dog looks like by using only this part not with this one right so that is what we are doing here so that's why dropout works well for dense layers but for convolution layers for images especially there might be so much background and if it is randomly dropped here then there are these kind of chances which is not good so that's why drop block is used drop block is again a separate paper available so they have introduced this concept and yolo v4 they have adopted this concept into the architecture so this drop block let us see how this drop block works okay we know that okay this is the drop block this is how you need to do so usually what i get is the probability score right so 0.25 that means 0.25 25% of my activations remove this one right so probability is 0.1 if i take that means 10% 10% of my activations i have to drop now if i want to drop 10% of the activations how can i decide that these should be side by side only here can i not go till here also why i am keeping till here only so that is why there is something called block size this is a parameter we can decide what should be my block size so if i say take this point okay and i need to remove this part so from this part how much i have to extend the block that is my block size okay so let us see this concept clearly so this drop block works like this so it will take the inputs as block size and there is a gamma which is the probability and there is a mode because during the inference we should not do during only training it should do only we will do drop out during the training only not the inference now what we are doing is we are creating this mask randomly create a sample mask so this mask we are creating which is this green color so this is my mask in this mask only i will select the random values so if my mask is having here this is 6 by 6 right and my probability is 0.25 okay that means in out of the 6 by 6 randomly drop 25% of them okay that means nine values 6 by 6 means 36 grids are there out of 36 grids you can randomly drop nine grids how to drop nine grids you can randomly select let's say here in this example it is selected here and here so if it is selected here automatically depending on the block size so here the block size is 5 by 5 depending on the block size you expand this region okay so that means you take this region depending on the block size automatically you expand to this part that is what this is right so you have two parameters one is 0.25 which is a probability and one is the block size how much you have to expand now why did i choose this green region only this as my mask why can't i choose the whole feature map as the green region because what happens is in case of drop size is 5 by 5 every point should be reasonable to expand the block if i keep the block size as my total feature map the probability came like this neuron okay this particular block i have to drop now my block size is 5 by 5 how can i expand this further i cannot expand these directions right that is not possible so this mask is selected in such a way that it has to be a uh, remaining feature should be available to incorporate this block size okay so that is what it is actually doing so if you check this one right they are creating a mask okay so that the width of block size the width and height of block size should be flexible here it should be available in this region it should not go beyond the feature map that is why the mask is selected like this because this mask is selected for block size of 5 by 5 if the block size is only 3 by 3 then the mask can go till here right hope you understood the concept how the mask is created so this is how you do the drop block if you take randomly this position you expand it till the block size 
and you remove all of the activations and you apply this mask directly on your original activations whatever the activations of layer is there all those activations you just apply this mask and then you normalize the features okay so this is how drop block works so hope you understood so they have experimented on the imagenet classification as well as the coco dataset both on resnet 50 and retina net and they have observed that on resnet 50 the accuracy jumped by 2% almost and this also almost 2% okay so there has been accuracy jumps by using drop block instead of drop out so this is how drop block works okay instead of dropping randomly these activation maps you drop some blocked portion so actually there is a similar concept available in data augmentation also so what we do is usually in data augmentation you take this portion okay and you just paste a white color or black color don't keep these features and give this image as the input to the network okay so this is a data augmentation concept similarly for doing the same thing on the activation maps you do drop block okay so hope you understood this concept clearly now let us see the ious so there are concepts available like diou ciou giou like that and in yolo before they mentioned that they have tried ciou and diou like this so let us understand what is iou loss first for bounding box regression we use smooth l1 loss which is a squared error okay but what is iou loss you know the iou concept which is intersection over union so this is used to check the matching between the anchor boxes and the ground truth so usually we check this is one box one is my ground truth and box two is the anchor box we need to see which is matching how much it is overlapping that is what we do so iou intersection and then union you take the division of them you will get the iou so this is a common concept used in all the object detection models and you keep a threshold saying that if it is greater than some 0.5 threshold then only i will consider that as a valid bounding box like that so like that you assign positive and negative boxes and calculate the loss like that now this is the iou concept if i want to use iou as the loss function what should i do so that should be 1 minus of iou this is nothing but 1 minus of iou how is this a loss function if you see this iou right this will be 1 if perfectly matching perfect overlap and this will be 0 if there is zero overlap usually what is the target of my training my target of the training is this one i should have the perfect overlap between the ground truth box and the anchor box that is my target so that means iou should be 1 or otherwise iou should be as high as possible this is my target now if i want to frame that as a loss function loss should be as minimum as possible so that is why 1 minus of iou if i take then this should be as minimum as possible that is how it is a loss function and also one more thing is if my iou is 0.7 okay iou is equal to 0.7 that means the boxes overlap between the ground truth and the anchor boxes are 0.7 now what is 1 minus iou this will be 0.3 and this 0.3 also i have to reduce that means whatever this 0.3 is there what is that actually that is the non overlapping region that is the non overlapping region so by using training we should reduce this non overlapping to zero that is my target so that is how you can frame this iou as the loss function using this formula 1 minus of iou simple if you take that indicates the non overlapping region we should minimize that non overlapping region to zero so that is how you can use iou loss and people found that iou loss works better compared to your smooth l1 loss okay so this is iou loss now what is the issue with this iou loss there is one issue if there is no overlap iou loss is very high that means iou is zero so if you look here if there is no overlap the iou is becoming zero so what does this mean if the iou is zero how will i know how will i fit the anchor box so if you take this one particular anchor box like this okay this is my ground truth and there is one more anchor box here which is my anchor now iou is equal to zero between them but i have to reduce this distance right between them i have to match them together that is my target of loss function if my loss function has to reduce automatically these two things i have to match 
I know that there is no overlap, but I need to count how much far it is. If it is here, it should be smaller value. Okay, my loss function should actually counter these things. Let's say if I have here anchor box. So if you take the distance here, right? So this is the distance here and this is the distance here. Which is better? Obviously, this is better. This is bad prediction, right? How will I choose that? How will I know that? Because my loss is one for both the cases. There is no overlap. Loss is one. But how will I know this is better prediction than this? So that is why you have to account for the distance also. Not only the overlap, you have to look for the distance also. How much they are far from each other. Okay. So that is where generalized IOU loss came. So this generalized IOU loss, what it does is it works on top of the IOU loss. So till here it is the IOU loss. And after the IOU loss, you add one more term here. So what is this term? Let us see clearly. What they are doing here is they are fitting the minimum enclosed rectangle. So this C is minimum enclosed rectangle. So they are fitting to see how far these two boxes are. If I take this is my ground truth and B is my anchor box. Definitely we know that this is better prediction than this one. So this is much better than this one. So to measure that, if you take the minimum enclosed rectangle, automatically this will be very big. The area is bigger. If they are far from each other, area will be smaller if they are near to each other. That is the concept, right? So this area of C, this will be very high. Okay. If they are far from each other. Similarly, if they are near, this will be very low like this. So we are adding one more term here to account for this distance. So what we are doing here, if we are looking at this formula clearly, what it is doing is you are taking the union part. This is the union of both the boxes. That means this is the region and this is the region. Both combined together union, right? Now I am subtracting it with C. C minus if this one. What is C? C is this total area. Now if I subtract that with the C, what will I get? This region, right? This red region is the one, the numerator term. And divided by C we are doing to normalize between 0, 1. The range should be between 0, 1. That's why you are normalizing it, dividing with the C. So ultimately what it is doing, if I am adding this to my loss function, I have to reduce this. So this particular C minus half B union B ground truth, whatever it is there, this total term I have to reduce. That means whatever the distance is there between these two, automatically it is implying that, right? Whatever this region is there, that region I have to reduce. That region is zero here because they are touching each other side by side. So that region is zero here. That's why my GIU is zero. I know that IOU is zero both of the cases because there is no overlap here also. There is no overlap here also. So IOU will be zero both the cases. But this is side by side. So that's why GIOU is zero. Whereas these are far from each other. So that's why there is some value here. So ultimately what it is doing this generalized IOU, it is actually measuring the distance between these two in the form of this area. Okay. Using this enclosed rectangle and it is trying to reduce that value by adding that to the loss function. Hope you understood it. Automatically as the box is moving near and near, this particular region will get reduced. Okay. So that is the concept of generalized IOU loss. Hope you understood the concept clearly. It is very simple to the existing IOU loss function. You added one more term to account for non overlapping boxes because we need to understand the loss should be higher for far away objects compared to near boxes. That is what you are adding one extra term here. Now there is one more loss function based on the same concept based on the distance concept only, which is called distance IOU. Now what they are doing is this is my previous loss. Okay. Generalized IOU and this is the distance IOU till here is my original IOU loss to that. I am adding one term here. What is this term? 
this numerator is nothing but the distance between the centroids okay so if you take this particular box this green is my ground truth and this is my anchor box if i take this one now this is actually the center point and this is the center of these two boxes i am calculating the distance between them so that d is nothing but this one okay this is actually d here fine and then i am but for normalizing i am using c okay the original distance is directly the distance between these two because it is automatically measuring the same even if the boxes are away from each other like this also you are measuring the distance between these two points okay even if there is no overlap also you are measuring the distance this one in di velocity concept is same for both generalized or distance okay only thing is they are solving in terms of the areas whereas distance i o u is solving in the direct distance calculation and for normalizing they have considered this enclosed box similar to your gi velocity and take the diagonal value because that should be your maximum value so automatically if i divide with that one this value should be always between 0 and 1 so for normalizing i am using this otherwise the actual term we are doing is directly the distance between the centers so that is the concept so the concept is very similar okay if you consider what this term is doing this term is doing both are same only thing is the way of implementation is different okay that is the only thing and they have found that using this distance values directly it will be faster to learn okay by doing the experiments they have done this one so if this is actually my original iou loss okay and this is actually g iou and this red color is d iou distance iou so if you take these numbers these are actually epochs so after 40th epoch it is the box is like this after 20th epoch the box is like this after 100 epoch it is still like this by using the gi velocity but by reaching the 40th epoch itself using diou i am able to get the box near to this and finally by 120th epoch i fitted it perfectly whereas in 400 epoch also giou is still trying to fit if you check in all the cases the original iou is still there there itself it will not move because the original iou loss is not considering this distance so it will not consider this only so that will be still there only whereas these two comparison giou and diou comparison if you see diou is taking very much lesser time to converge these boxes okay that is the importance of this diou now comes ciou so let us understand the problem with these things so there are no problem per se but only thing is one critical point is missing in these loss functions so they are considering the overlap okay that is how your iou is getting calculated that is fine how much overlap is there between these two like that and they are considering the distance between them okay so if there is no overlap also they are trying to bring them together that is fine but they are not worrying about the aspect ratio if you see this giou the first time box came like this at 40th epoch and then it expanded like this and then it expanded like this if you see different different aspect ratios are there but if my original ground truth is like this even my anchor box also should have the similar aspect ratio right the squareish aspect ratio so can i make a restriction saying that whatever the aspect ratio is there the shape of the ground truth box if my anchor box also is having the same shape then there is a better chance of easy overlap faster overlap right so till now we have considered the overlapping area and the distance between the centers but now in the complete iou loss we consider the aspect ratio also so very simple concept this is your di iou loss previously we have seen this is the iou loss and then this is the distance penalty okay whatever the distance between both the boxes the distance penalty now you add one more term to it this is actually catering to aspect ratio now how can i check if my ground truth and the anchor box having same aspect ratio aspect ratios are nothing but width and height right so if i compare the width and height of ground truth with width and height of the anchor boxes somehow that should be my penalty term here right so that is what i am doing i am taking tan inverse of weight by height this is for ground truth and same way tan inverse of weight by height for anchor box 
So subtracting them, squaring them and then dividing by this pi square because these are in angles. You will get tan inverse. If you take tan inverse, you will get in degrees angles. So that's why you are taking this to convert into real values. And then you are adding one weighting factor here, alpha. Alpha you can calculate like this. So V is here. Using V only you can get the alpha. So this is actually offset factor we call it. So ultimately the concept is to consider all these three points in the loss function because all these three points are important for the loss function. IOU will take care of the first part overlapping area and distance between the centers will take care by DIOU concept. Okay. By adding this term and by adding the one additional aspect ratio term, this will be taken care of. Okay. So hope you understood these IOU loss concepts. Okay. These are very, very simple concepts, but uh, there are lot many so people will get confused and say that these are difficult okay but these are very simple concept from iou you can derive giou and then you can derive diou and then you can derive complete ciou so these are the loss functions and in yolo before they have tried ciou and diou they have done one experiment to see the convergence okay if you check this one this is my ground truth region and around this there are these all these small small dots right these dots are these many regression cases, 1.7 million regression cases. That means each dot at each dot, you are considering seven anchor boxes of different shapes. And this is my ground truth of again, seven different shapes. Now by applying these different loss functions, how many iterations each of them took to converge? That means if my box is this point, how much iterations it took to make it near to this one. If my box is near here, anchor box is here, then how many iterations it took to make it reach here. If my anchor box is here, how many iterations it took to reach here. So this circle is all possible anchor points distances. If I start here, my anchor box, how many iterations it took to reach this like this, they have considered the dummy anchor boxes for all these regions. So these are 1.7 million anchor boxes. And then they have applied this IOU, GIOU, DIOU and CIOU. And then you can see the convergence rate. IOU is almost flat curve because whatever the near region is there, only those will be converging. Whatever overlapping is there. If this and this is overlapping, then only the IOU loss will reduce. For all these points, IOU loss will be the same. It will not reduce. So that's why it is like this. Whereas, GIOU and DIOU and CIOU, all of them three, even if there is no overlap also, they try to compute the loss and they try to bring them together. But if you see GIOU is taking lot of time, even at 200 epochs, the error is still high. Whereas if you take DIOU and CIOU, both of them are almost similar. Only thing is because CIOU has additional aspect ratio factor, it is slightly faster, slightly slight margin only, but yeah. So this is how these loss functions perform. So the remaining concepts are mostly data argumentations and this also data argumentation. This is also target label smoothing, very simple concept and training schedulers, mostly like adversarial training, LR schedulers, how to choose the optimal hyperparameters. They have used genetic algorithm to choose the optimal hyperparameters random training shapes. So these concepts we will cover in the next video. Hope you understood these concepts, whatever we discussed clearly. Thank you.